first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. I wanted to pull that up. That is our live look from our ski bowl camera on top of Mount Hood. I've been seeing a bunch of skiers and snowboarders going through there earlier today, but pretty nice view. You can't really see the peak right there, but in case you didn't know, that is a volcano. And uh, we're talking about volcanoes today, one a little bit up further north, uh, but that's in part. Again, this is Fox 12 Now. We are live streaming here out of the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom as we do every weekday starting around 1 p.m. and then going throughout the afternoon covering a wide range of topics. But you may have seen it in the news. There is an Alaskan volcano, Mount Spur, which is just west of Anchorage, I believe 70 or 80 miles. We'll, we'll confirm exactly how far here in just a minute that uh, has about a 50-50 chance of erupting from what we've heard so far. We want to find out more about that and maybe how that can relate to some information about our local volcanoes as well. To do so, we've got Matt Haney from the USGS and the Alaska Volcano Observatory. And Matt, thanks for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Um, love learning more about uh, about things like this. And, you know, Mount Spur is one that's certainly been in the news a lot lately. And to start off for everybody, in case they don't know, could you give us just a little bit of information about where it's located and some of the things that are happening up there? For sure, and Greg, thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm here in Anchorage, Alaska, Matt Haney with the Alaska Volcano Observatory, and uh, Mount Spur is, uh, has been keeping us busy. Mount Spur is the closest volcano to Anchorage, where I am, and as you, as you said, Greg, it's uh, 75 miles to the west of here. We have, similar to the Pacific Northwest, we have you know many volcanoes uh, here in Alaska. Oh, great, yeah, there's, there's a map right there showing it just to the west of, uh, of Anchorage, and in uh, April of last year, we first noticed the er earthquake activity at, at Mount Spur started increasing above background levels. So we've been we've been tracking it really close. When it first started in April, May of last year, it was uh, about 30 small earthquakes per week. And when I say small, I mean at a volcano, earthquakes are are typically magnitude one or less. But but we still pick them up on our on our on our stations there, and then over the summer it kind of backed away from that a little bit. But then in the fall the earthquake rate picked up again, and we started uh, picking up you know a uh, hundred per week or or more, as many as three hundred uh, per week. So that's uh, that's that's been going on. It, it continues. And uh, because of that that elevated earthquake rate, we uh, we went to an elevated uh, uh, color code in October. We went from green, which is background, to the next level, which is uh, uh, yellow, and and that's where we are uh, at, at yellow, which means there's unrest indicative of an uncertain future eruption. Uh, the the next two color codes that we have is if we saw even more. Uh, uh, evidence of uh, progress, progressing unrest, then we would go to orange, which means even more definitive uh, indications of a future eruption. And then, of course, were to go to an eruption, then we would go to our color code. Red. So, uh, in, in addition to the the increased earthquakes, we also have seen deformation of the volcano, the the surface of the volcano, and uh, our high-grade uh, GPS uh, instruments shows it's been inflating outward over the past year, and the closest station, the outward inflation, is about two and a half inches. And then we've also seen the summit of the volcano, which is usually in ice and snow. You can see it right behind me. Whoops. Uh, yeah, the, the the summit right there, uh, right over my 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 shoulder here. Whoops. Uh, this is the summit, <laughs> and usually it's in uh, ice and snow. But then it's been melting over the past year, and there's a uh, a lake up in the uh, up in the crater that we've been uh, looking at. Oh, and there's some of a recent uh, aerial uh, uh, video of it. This was a recall taken on February seventh during uh, an overflight and some uh, network operations at the uh, at the volcano. So you can see the steam and and the uh, the melting there at the summit. So those are the ones that have been showing us anomalous or increased behavior. We, we do have one data stream that we look at as well, uh, volcanic gas. Usually before volcanoes erupt, we can see increased amounts of volcanic gas like sulfur dioxide, and we can measure that. And we have done three what we call gas flights, uh, similar to what we were just looking at. We can, oh, uh, yeah. we, we, that, that video was, was uh, 
There was also volcanic gas measurements made that day, but we have not seen an unusual amount of, of volcanic gas. So that's you know, indicating some of the uh, the complexity. You know, we have some of our data streams are showing increase in uh, unrest, but then we have not yet seen any uh, any notable in volcanic gas. Well, there's a lot of different observations that you're making with this all at the same time. So it sounds like you're using satellite. Um, you know, imagery as far as noticing that that expansion of it. You've got the monitors on there for the earthquakes. You're monitoring gas. Um, this combination of all this data with all of that and studying it, and then you know finding out whether or not it erupts or, de or doesn't erupt, is collecting all of this data on this volcano going to be helpful for other volcanoes for observing, you know, whether or not there could be potential eruptions somewhere else and learning from what it is that you're collecting with this. Yes, this is one of our most well monitored and instrumented volcanoes in Alaska on account of it being so close to Anchorage. So the data that we're collecting, we uh, we're sharing it with our colleagues, uh, it, it, especially the colleagues at uh, at Cascades Volcano Observatory in uh, in Vancouver. And in fact, uh, the the volcanologists at uh, Cascades Volcano Observatory have been involved uh, in on our meetings and and helping us to interpret the uh, interpret the data that we're we're collecting. So so even though it's you know it's here in Alaska the the wealth of data that we're collecting you know it can be interpreted you know in in the context of other volcanoes that have had unrest other uh, times that volcanoes have uh, have progressed to an eruption. So so it's really you know uh, very valuable to have that rich data set that we can use to uh, diagnose what's what's happening at Mount Spur. Yeah, it helps helps everybody out. I mean, obviously with Mount St. Helens here right next to us, but Mount Hood, Mount Rainier, Jefferson. I mean, there's there's a, a Mount Adams. There's a lot of them uh, around here. Uh, so when it comes to uh, this erupt, you know, this potential eruption, is there any indication of and I don't know if this is something that you have or not, or any indication of if this were to erupt, how big of an eruption it could be. Spur has had historical eruptions. So its its previous eruptions were in 1992 and 1953. And so if it were to go to an eruption, the most likely scenario would be a repeat of of that those types of eruptions and, and those those eruptions in 92 and 53 were very similar now an interesting twist at at spur that makes it uh even uh you know more interesting than it would otherwise be is that uh those eruptions in 53 and 92 did not come from the summit of the volcano they came from a what we call a flank vent uh which is two miles south of the volcano and that flank vent is called crater peak so, so that's uh, that, that's an interesting twist at uh, at Mount Spur, and and so those eruptions in 1992 and 1953, they came from Crater Peak. They put ash clouds up to you know, 50,000 feet into the atmosphere, and ash fell on Anchorage, in both uh, in both cases. In the amount of uh, in 1992 it was about an eighth of an inch, and in 1953 it was a quarter of an inch. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that's that's enough to uh, you know uh, be a nuisance and to disrupt. Uh, for example, operations at our airport in 1992 were closed for 20 hours. So, so that's the uh, that's the main hazard to uh, to Anchorage. But it's you know it's something we're keeping very close uh, tabs on. The fact that those eruptions came from Crater Peak, this uh, this flank vent two miles south of the summit, whereas Today, all of the un, you know the unrest has been mainly at the summit of the volcano, and and to put that into context, there was a, a period of elevated earthquakes and melting at the summit in 2004 that ultimately did not lead to an eruption. So, so that's uh, that's another you know. Uh, uh, his, his, his historical fact of the volcano that we're taking into account in our interpretation. So, so one of the ways of of thinking about that, you know, 50-50 uh, types of odds or equally likely an eruption from Crater Peak or no eruption is that just since we've been monitoring it closely, uh, Spur has had two unrest episodes, one in 1992, one in 2004, 2005, and the one in 1992 uh, progressed all the way to an eruption, whereas in 2004, 2005, it had unrest, 
melted the summit, but ultimately did not lead to an eruption. So, so and even, you know, I guess with all of that observation and all of that data, yeah, it's still a difficult thing to determine whether or not it's going to going to go one way or another. Um, what is, uh, just, just to understand, so you have these, you know, a couple hundred earthquakes that are happening um, and, and all this other monitoring and this data, what do you need to see next in order to, I guess, up the, the warning level for, the, for a potential eruption? Yes, that's uh, very important. So, so in our monitoring data, there are signals that we're looking at that will give us, you know, weeks to months of even more uh, indications or warnings that the volcano is progressing uh, towards an eruption. And, and these signals did not happen in 2004, 2005, but they did happen in 1992. One of them is what we call volcanic tremor. And this is a type of uh, signal that's picked up on uh, seismic ground sensors. And it's different from an, earth, an earthquake, like a little earthquake, like a magnitude one or even magnitude two. It's, it's over very quickly in just a few seconds. Uh, but tremor is just a continuous shaking of the, the volcano. It can go on for minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, even longer. And in 1992 at Spur, the scientists at the Volcano Observatory at that time saw this type of signal three weeks before it began erupting. So, so our, our uh, analysts here at uh, AVO are looking very closely for any of that type of uh, seismic signal because it's, uh, it's important to, uh, to give us even more uh, indications that the volcano is progressing towards an eruption. Uh, other signals we're looking for is, I, I mentioned it earlier, if we began to measure volcanic gas on our gas flight, uh, then that would be another data stream that is currently not anomalous that would start to show uh, a significant uh, signal. And then also just uh, increased in more intense and uh, stronger earthquake activity. Uh, we, we, we're looking for all those. Yeah, all the combo of all of those different things. I, I think uh, my, my final question is just in the, in the scheme of, you know, the Cascades uh, volcanoes, the Alaskan volcanoes, and obviously to a larger extent the, the Ring of Fire there, have you noticed an uptick in activity from volcanoes in general along the Pacific Rim? None uh, in general along the Pacific Rim. So the, these volcanoes, they, you know, they, they, they do all share in common that they're, they're caused by subducting of the, uh, of the plates that are being subducted or pushed underneath the, uh, the continental plates, just like in the Pacific Northwest. But, but th these volcanoes, they, they operate on their own uh, schedule. They have their own supply of magma that, uh, that is coming up beneath them. And so activity at, at Mount Spur, which is uh, the most likely interpretation is from a, a magma intrusion beneath the volcano, it's just affecting uh, Spur. But, uh, but, you know, our other uh, volcanoes in Alaska, it, it, it doesn't have any uh, particular uh, bearing on, on their behavior. Uh, so so we, we actually do have another volcano in Alaska out in the Aleutian Islands that's uh, having an eruption today. Uh, uh, it's not an explosive eruption. It's at a volcano called Great Sick, and, and we're also monitoring that. But that that eruptive activity is is uh, is not related to Mount Spur, or or or, or the volcanoes uh, along the uh, the Ring of Fire and the Pacific Rim. But we know that uh, you know we live in very active areas, both uh, both you and I. So we have earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides. That's something that that we've learned to adapt to. On the Pacific Rim, we have you know beautiful landscapes, but we also have these uh, natural uh, events that uh, that we have learned to uh, live with. Absolutely, well, and and to live with them, you know, you need all of that data and all the information that you gather, and you and uh, you and your teams, you know, with USGS. So really appreciate um, having you on to talk about this and explain it a little bit for everybody to understand it in 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 both that context of right there with Mount Spur and what it could be for, for the Anchorage area, but also in the context of the Pacific Northwest and Alaska as well. So Matt, thank you very much for joining us. I really, really appreciate the information. All right, thanks so much, Greg, for having me on. I, I really enjoyed uh, talking with you. Absolutely, yeah, and if, uh, if we have an eruption, may, uh, may uh, dial you up here again too. All right.
I'm not looking forward to it, but if it, if it goes that way, we'll talk some more. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And for everybody who's watching live, again, this is Fox 12 Now. We're going to take a break here. Um, I'll be back uh, shortly at uh, 1.30 p.m. if you're watching live. And if you're watching, watching afterward, that's fantastic, too, because we're uh, available on all kinds of different platforms, including the Fox 12 Oregon apps, kptv.com, under the Fox 12 Now tab, and wherever else you may be finding us. So we uh, uh, do appreciate that. And again, I'll be talking to you here throughout the afternoon. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.